What? Hi, Melanie. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you? Very well. So you're in Germany, aren't you? Yes, I'm in Hamburg, so quite high up in Germany. Yes. Very good. You, have you got a cup of tea, Melanie? No, I have a cup of water, actually. Okay. For me, this is water time right now. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what I'm drinking because it was um, given to me by La Durée. So look at this. Look how cute this is. I don't know if you're a tea person, Melanie, but look, it's... Oh, that's that beautiful. Is this one of those uh, boxes that you keep, right? After you've used all the tea inside. Oh, yeah. wonderful. I, I, I wanted to... a little bag, La Durée. <laughs> oh, brilliant. How, how many different teacups do you have? Every time I see you with a new one, actually, that's quite a collection you must have. I, I have quite a few teacups, but this is actually one of the La Durée ones, and it's, uh, it's quite a wide one, not as ornamental as I like. But anyway, here we are. Cheers to your water. Here's to my tea. <laughs> okay, Cheers. <laughs> Great. So, Melanie, I know that you've been really busy during lockdown, despite having two small children. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you've been up to. Well, uh, how can I say? It's. I think I felt. I feel that since February, everything has changed in a way, in sometimes positive ways and sometimes negative ways. And I try not to to look at the difficult side of things. So. We spent a lot of time with the boys and then my husband and I, we completely adjusted our schedule. We we're very lucky to be, to have our own um, jobs. So we could work in the evenings. We could work when the kids were taking a nap, which was mm -hmm. really nice. And we're very fortunate to have a house with a garden, which meant we had outdoor space in comparison to a lot of people who were locked in an apartment. Yeah, that's a big difference. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I'm always trying to see the positive side of things. And that was definitely one of the highlights of having a garden and being able to actually enjoy spring in Hamburg, which was fantastic. I, um, I didn't get to travel, obviously, at all, which I usually do for work, which gave me much more time to focus. I was in the middle of designing and starting the production of uh, new pieces. We're actually completing 10 years uh, this year of my own brand and it felt like an important year to to celebrate to look back to focus to think of the future um, and then of course things changed during the lockdown because suddenly the the idea of preparing new pieces feels invested with other sort of feelings and I think when I um, present this new collection hopefully in in October in uh, Pad Paris uh -huh. one will be able to see the evolution of the pieces throughout this period because I, w I wanted to show it actually not hide it and pretend that it never happened right. um, so I was really busy with the production of that and sort of taking into account that certain people who worked for us were not able to work others others were actually able to work from home and sort of adjusting and it's taken far longer but it actually gave me time to really decide on the details of the pieces and go again and, and rework the designs much more. So I think yeah. given the situation, a lot of positives came out uh, for and that specific collection. Not, I've seen many on your social media as well and um, on your website, which is something that we could all do during mm -hmm. lockdown. Yeah, we, it, it's sort of, we were, I think it was a decision that was made before the lockdown, but it was very, very beneficial because we slightly tweaked the, the website to allow people to contact us about a specific piece and ask for prices because we don't put any prices on the website. Mm -hmm. And actually that shows we had an increase of requests for prices, for press. We also had a lot of uh, interest in private commissions. It felt like people wanted to not necessarily buy a new piece, but they wanted to potentially adjust or rework something they had inherited. And I think they were looking for the feel factor without necessarily investing in a whole new piece sometimes, but actually having something that was close to them, but they wouldn't necessarily wear. And they wanted that to be reworked so that they would wear it again. So there was actually a lot of interest and a lot of activity during those uh, last yeah. four months, I think. It's interesting because I've heard from other jewelers who I've spoken to on this series as well, that there have been quite a lot of um, private commissions, bespoke work. And I think that's what you were saying earlier about spending more time thinking about everything and thinking more about your clients and how you can be closer to them. Absolutely. And I think people are now more than ever interested in who makes their jewelry and they want to have a feel good factor about commissioning work or buying pieces. They want to 
um, know where it's made, so they want much more information, but they also want to connect with a jeweler who actually makes it or designs it. And I think that was really um, visible in the requests that, we, that we've been getting lately. And it's really nice to finally connect more with private clients, actually, from my end. So I was really happy about that. Good, good. And I know that you're coming to 10 years as you're with your own brand, Melanie. And I think what we planned was that you were going to take us through that evolution. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. So I think it's, um, it was a time to look back and to sort of reflect. And we also prepared a book for private clients, which is actually a chronological, um, it's a booklet, actually, mm -hmm. chronological um, diary of all the pieces of design for my brand, as well as the collaboration that I'm doing with Tasaki. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a good time with your with our interview to pick out those pieces that I felt were more significant for me and sort of explain a bit the detail or what it meant at the time for me to make those pieces. Fantastic. So I want to start with a necklace that I actually made and designed when I was at the RCA, when I was still studying. And this is really when I found my passion for pearls. Um, it's a long, I think they call it a sautoir. So it's a long, um, simple white pearl necklace. I've done color variations too. And the idea was to start from a whole pearl and then gradually take off some of the material to reveal the basically, as, to go as close to the center as possible of the pearl. So I'll just uh, flip the camera and um, show you the other way around. Okay, I'll talk while you do that, Melanie, because I know it's difficult to flip. Let me see. So ah, there we go. Wait yeah. Show jewelry. Ah, oh, that is perfect. Uh, wow. You see? So this is as close as it gets to the core. And I think it's interesting to showcase the inside of the pearl and to really show that every single pearl is different, even though they're cultured. For me, that was a celebration of the organic nature of those cultured pearls, which even though they are cultured and they look exactly the same from the outside, it's only when you cut them that you really see that some have a double center or some have more layers than others. And I thought... I mean, it was a very instinctive work at the time, but I really thought that um, it was really a celebration of what it is to, to own a pearl necklace and show the inside as well as the outside. Absolutely. And for me, I'll show you the, the black version, actually, because it gives you a totally different feel, and even though it's exactly the same piece. So you did this for, at the um, Royal College of Arts, and you were experimenting with, with pearls, and it's something that was so um, different and so unique that it's carried through your work ever since. Is that right? Absolutely. At the time, I think I wasn't sure I was going to continue to work with pearls, but there was so much interest in what I did. I had a lot of commissions after graduating that I decided for the next three years, I was working as a freelance designer and then I was working on my own pieces on the weekends. And after those three years um, in 2010, I basically decided to establish my own brand, which focused on redesigning what contemporary pearl jewelry is. Mm. And I've never looked back really. And as you will see, a lot of the pieces um, that I'm going to show you today, they are basically chapter of chapters of the same book. Um, so I'm trying to find new ways to, to look at the pearls for every single collection. Yeah. Well, they look really good with that set up, Melanie, by the way. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> shall I continue? Please. <laughs> okay. So I think I want to say also that the, the pearl jewelry that I've designed, it sort of goes from working with the pearl as a material, looking at the pearl as a fashion statement, uh, looking at um, just working with very, very small pearls or very large pearls, really looking at all aspects. So that's why one could say that um, the pearl jewelry I'm going to show you can look very different from each collection looks quite different from the previous one. But I think that's also one of the strengths of this sort of 10 year trajectory. So I want to show you this one, which is a very special piece also because it was eventually taken on by, I'll turn the camera. It was eventually taken on by Tasaki as one of their collections. Um, it's a drilled pearl. So it's actually hollow. Um, you can see the chain going through and the idea was to have the club simple pearl pendant but to drill it so many times but that the core comes out and when you hold it it's uh -huh. extremely light 
Can you hold so, it really badly without your hand behind it so you can really see the fact that it's... Ah, uh, yes, true. Let's see. Because it, it, it's, it's quite surprising when you realise... Ah. I don't know the focus. <laughs> oh, maybe it wasn't... There. There, yeah. So you the can light see. shining through it. And the, there you can see it perfectly. So you Absolutely. can get some of the luster from the inside. Don't Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this happens to be, this is a peacock pearl, so you can mm -hmm. see the color difference between the outer layers and the inside layers. But I think it transforms it into something else. And you're not quite sure. And I really like this ambiguity. And I was specifically for this collection, I was very honored that Tasaki took it on because it was a, a great challenge to for a Japanese brand to actually produce pieces like that, which turn the pearl into something completely different. Particularly as they are such major pearl producers themselves and it's something of a tradition in their family. So that's Absolutely. Quite... I mean, already a collaboration with a Japanese brand that started in 2012 was quite spectacular because I think it was either going to work or not work. Mm -hmm. And actually it worked really well. Of course, we didn't only produce um, drilled pearls. We actually did much more, uh, I wouldn't say classic, but I would say much more uh, wearable or everyday uh more conventional pearl pieces like this one which is the arlequin yeah and this is instead of cutting away the pearl you would actually cover it with a sheet of gold so it actually become it's such a simple design in a way but it translates so well into everyday wearable pieces and i really like the symmetry asymmetry of this one because mm -hmm. a lot of the pearl jewelry that was happening until I started playing with this <laughs> 10 years ago was very symmetrical, very classic. And this is a very simple way of just turning the symmetry upside down. It's it goes on one side. Different from every angle. When you held it um, with the pearl facing us, it looked like it was floating. Exactly. And I, th I really like having pieces which are very easy to wear that you forget to wear. Not everything has to be a statement. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the um, key attributes of jewelry that I really love that it becomes part of yourself eventually and if it's a really nice piece of jewelry you just wear it every day and you completely forget it's there yeah. um, a lot of the pieces I'm showing you now are Tasaki pieces simply because at the beginning the, they sort of when we started the collaboration in 2012 they actually took on a lot of my early work mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I started designing only for them and then having my own brand on the side. So there is um, evolution in the two uh, brands, which I will show you a bit later on. This is also a piece that I really wanted to talk about because I made this initially for, I'll turn the camera actually, you can see the huh? design a bit better. Yeah, you see the luster of the pearls is incredible on this one. So this is a bracelet, you wear it from the side. So the idea is that the pearls are actually touching the skin when you wear it. And the metal is used, obviously, to hold the pearls in place, but also to protect the pearls from when you're, you know, basically hitting your hand on, on the desk or at the table when you're writing or when you're working. And this was initially produced um, during my rock vault time, which was uh, curated by Stephen Webster. It was an initiative that was... Uh, uh, organized by the British Fashion Council and we did this for several um, seasons they even took us to Couture in Las Vegas so it was an opportunity to really um, help British based jewelers to have a wider recognition to do wholesale with larger stores and it's a great initiative really rock vault and a shame it's not here anymore isn't it I think it's I think it's gone completely yeah, it's but gone. Um, which I thought, I mean, I was so lucky to be part of that initiative and to really be during those high years when you had uh, a brand like Palladium sponsoring the metal and helping us create this, those designs because it's usually when you have someone sponsoring you that you can just go wild. And for me at the time, this was quite wild, even though it's actually a really good seller now at Tasaki. So it had... Um, it's so unusual, so original, but it's still, you know, all the beauty of the pearl. Yeah, I think one of those, this is one of those initiatives that should either come back in another shape or form. Come on, Stephen. Please, please, please. Or this kind of support should continue, especially for jewelers in the UK. Yeah, I get um, it from young jewelers asking you know, advice, how do I set out? So hearing you talk, I think, is really valuable for them because yeah. the experience of designing for other brands, of um, them having a collaboration, 
and having literally to have several jobs at once by the sound of it. Yes, absolutely. But this is what makes you stronger also as a designer, as a yeah. practitioner, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an everything, you know, this is really important. And I think that's something that I learned um, in the UK, especially that no one's going to hand you anything and you just mm -hmm. have to make it work. And I see the different cultures now having worked in Japan, having li living now in Germany. And it's, it's fascinating to see how sometimes the less you have, the more creative you end up being. And this is something that I've applied during this COVID time where everything is changing. You just have to adapt. And I think it, we need to be creative in our mindset, not only in our work. And I'm lucky enough that I'm creative for, for my work, but that means I want to apply this creativity into all aspects of my life and basically... Yeah. adapt um, this is also a very important piece for me because this is one of the celebratory pieces of Tasaki for this their 60 year anniversary in 2014 and it comes from one of the early designs that I did with the sliced pearls that got me into <laughs> a lot of trouble uh, but for their anniversary I'll turn the camera for their anniversary they decided to take on some designs and basically highlight them. And this was normally that we produce this without the gold and for the, their anniversary, they decide to cover all the slices with gold. This is a, one of the smaller versions. There's another version of the necklace where you have basically half split. This is technically quite complicated because you have to make sure that the pearls stay in place. So every pearl has two holes and has two strands of thread going through, which means that no matter how you wear it, this, this split is always gonna be aligned and you're not gonna have the pearls rolling around. So it's this deceiving simplicity that, especially with Tasaki, it just makes it so effortless and so perfectly made that I'm always in awe of what they're capable to make for me. And this is, I find this absolutely brilliant. It's, it's very um, clever. I remember looking at that for the first time, what, thinking, how, well, if you drill through the pearls for the whole ones, what, how did that continue? And of course, there's a lot of clever uh, little solutions in there. Okay, can Absolutely. Can we see a little bit closer, Melanie? Let's see. I, I think. So it's... you'll probably see the reflection exactly of the window. It used to be a bit more polished, but I've worn it a few times. Okay. So um, someone's asking, what challenges do you face when drilling a pearl, Melanie? Uh, many. Um, well, um, I would say to anyone wanting to drill any pearl, you need to have a very good drill. Otherwise, depending on the pearl, and you usually end up having um, a bad surprise. Uh, if it's depending on the quality of the outer layer, you can just chip around the hole. So that's the first problem and then you either have to if it's a small chip you can sand it a little bit and try to hide it with the knot or you just have to start all over again um and then once you yeah I'm just you double that. drill sorry when you double drill which means you need to go both ways and sort of meet, meet in the middle mm -hmm. well you need to do it absolutely in the center otherwise um you're not you're not the, the two holes are not going to meet <laughs> but um <laughs> We're lucky enough that actually most pearls, you can get them drilled by your supplier, which means you can okay. ask. And if they're really good quality pearls, they're not drilled at all. And then you can tell them exactly where you want the hole to be, which is actually a really nice service because the pearls are getting drilled by pearl drills, which are quite specific. So you want to make sure that you don't get it wrong. <laughs> I bet, I bet. But well, you're the yes. person to ask that question, definitely. Absolutely. I'm the pearl lady, I know. <laughs> So I also want to show um, other pearls I've been working with because, of course, everyone thinks of pearls as white pearls, mainly the freshwater ones because they're the most available ones. These are the ones I actually started working with because they come in a great variety of sizes and colors, so they're very versatile and you can find them very easily. But I found, I discovered a few years ago something called a Mabe pearl, and it's, sorry, and it's what they call a blister pearl. Yeah, so it's a pearl. Melanie, yeah. 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 So it's a pearl that, um, first of all, you can see. Yeah, let's see if it's going to focus. It's a yeah. pearl that has quite a special color. It's a bit grayish, a bit silvery, a bit purpley in comparison uh -huh. to a white pearl, which actually I can bring you one here. If oh, you look see at that. Yeah, we can see the difference. Very nice. 
it's much larger. And what you need to do is cut it off the oyster. So the base of this pearl normally is the oyster. You get about half a pearl, you need to cut around it. And in Japan, especially, I think they're very highly regarded, whereas in the West, um, they're not really used that much, I think. And, and you mentioned um, all blister pearls because they look literally like a blister in the nail cut. Exactly. Exactly. It's not a very nice name, I think, a blister pearl. But yeah, it basically describes what it is. Uh -huh. And this piece is, for me, quite special because, first of all, it uses two blister pearls. So one on one side and one on the other. And obviously, you can't see the middle because we've covered it. And it also uses the trademark Sakura gold, which is... Um, a type of red gold, 18 karat red gold. And obviously it's faceted like a diamond because there is such a traditional relationship between pearls and diamonds. And I thought it was um, a bit funny, a bit humorous to actually try and merge them together, those two concepts. Yeah, and something so, that we've never seen before. Yeah, and it's a very wearable pendant, which again, a, a lot of the work I do for Tasaki, it's for Japanese market and it's very important for me that these are pieces which are worn every day and cherished absolutely yeah. so I really like the color combination of this because it goes a bit further than the classic white pearl yellow gold that we're all very used to yeah absolutely yeah so uh, I am gonna start from another piece from this angle and this is again a special piece but for a very different reason this is from the Stretch collection. This is a double pearl pendant. It's 18 karat yellow gold with a large uh, freshwater pearl, actually. And it gives you the impression that the chain has been stretched to hold the pearl. And the reason why this piece is special for me or this, this collection is because it just has the two elements, the gold and the pearls. And I'm always trying to find a way to take as much away as possible but to still have an impact. And I really like the effortlessness of this collection because it just looks like it was always meant to be that way. And I think that's actually quite a, a difficult thing to achieve sometimes. Absolutely. Can we and see, sit closer, Melanie, with the detail of the, of the gold chain yes. stretching over the pearl? Because it, it, it it's, it's a very clever, it's, it's, it's a witty play with an idea, isn't it? It's, to me, it looks yes. like a, a net is pulling up this pearl and the weight of the pearl is pushing apart the gold this is exactly what it's meant to to give you out as a as a feeling and as an idea absolutely mm -hmm. and i want to show you the earrings in that collection which are slightly smaller pearls that's the longer version mm -hmm. and what you can do is you can actually take this little loop ah clever put it oh, on. i'm going to yeah. try and do this as effortlessly as i can as you effortless can't see what you're doing right <laughs> Sort of, yes. <laughs> Put the good. butterfly back on and you can wear it as a shorter version. And this is where you have the detail. That's very neat. Very nice. Yeah. So I really love taking an idea like that and breaking it into several pieces so that every woman can find something if they like earrings more, if they like rings more. There's always a good breakdown of the collections into five or 10, sometimes 15 pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, then I know you've got uh, more Melanie because I've got my list here. <laughs> oh, well, you have your list. I have the pieces in front of me, uh, so I'm much more visual than you. Um, I think at this around that time with Tasaki, I decided that I needed to differentiate a little bit what I was doing for Tasaki and what I was doing for my own brand because yeah. basically what I do for Tasaki is really what I would design for myself, mm -hmm. which is, it's actually such a great collaboration. Um, but I felt the need to expand in my own practice. And um, the first thing I did was actually continue looking at different pearls. So one of the uh, collections I did was the Baroque mm. collection. It's a very small collection, but I basically handpicked Baroque, Baroque freshwater pearls. And I just did very simple white gold wire around them. I'm gonna turn the camera and show you if I can press the button. There we go. Oh, yeah. And you can now see can the see. luster on this. And each one and has such an amazing shape. It, it's, it's, you know, it each one is different. Different. And this is what I like with pearls that they range from something where you can find, well, in a normal size, um, 
a lot which are similar and this is always the goal for a pearl necklace that they all have to match they have to be mm. the same size same luster and it goes all the way to the opposite which is you find just these massive huge beautiful they they just look like they look so organic and i really wanted to celebrate that yeah. and this is the necklace yes that is in the same collection and you just have to follow the pearl which i also really like that you don't you have to to listen to what the pearl says to you and i just wanted to make a very um sort of simple simple lines that basically highlight this incredible shape Absolutely. and this incredible color and luster yeah, and, and, and Baroque pearls are just fascinating. I think we're more inter interested in them than we were, say, 10 years ago because of the fact that they are so um, evocative of the many kinks and quirks and turns of nature as opposed to the perfection of the diamond or the perfect pearl. And it's Absolutely. Being I, think, I have a feeling that generally there is a shift towards imperfection or mm -hmm. towards individuality, and people are more open to having the classic pearl strand necklace, but they also want the exact opposite, which is either a piece for them or a piece with a pearl that feels very unique or very special. It either has a story or it has a very unique shape. And I really like that shift because I've clearly seen it the last three, four years, the kind of pieces that people have been asking for or they have been more in the press. Yeah. Um, it really feels that people just want to know more. Absolutely. about the design they want to have something that um attracts attention but in a subtle way so i i really i'm quite happy to have been in this for so long although 10 years is probably not that long in comparison to other people to have noticed the shift actually yeah and, and so, so uh, i was asking Melanie if if you glue the pearls or are they drilled and the pearls are, they always have to be secured on the piece because if I simply glued them, they would fall off after one minute. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are always drilled depending on the piece. They might be drilled once, depending on if it's a larger pearl, they might be drilled two or three times, but they absolutely have to be secured on the piece. I mean, gluing is not really going to get you that far. And yeah. from working with private clients, um, you get to meet the people that you sell the jewelry to. So you want to give them as best something which is as perfect as you can. You can't just get away with giving something that falls off after a month because those people are just simply not going to appreciate that. Yeah. So I've, I've got a, a, a comment on the screen that I can't get rid of. <laughs> Does anybody know how to get rid of it? <laughs> can you see? Ah, is it? Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think I, get, I can see it too. How do I get rid of that? <laughs> I, it's gone now from my oh, side. Sorry about that. Okay, good. You weren't showing jewelry. Now, let's go. Yeah. And next. Um, I wanted to finish with a Tasaki piece. I wanted to finish the Tasaki pieces with, a, with one design, and then I'm going to carry on with the pieces I've been doing the last three yeah. or four years, um, which for me encompasses really Tasaki craftsmanship mm -hmm. and what MG Tasaki is basically about so this is i'm just going to turn the camera because it's so small this is a quarter of a pearl <laughs> which has which has been covered um with yellow gold i think this is as small as we can get unless i persuade them to do a sixth of a pearl or an eighth of a pearl <laughs> um and this is called the wedge collection mm -hmm. and it just, it looks so perfect. It is so perfectly made and it looks so effortless and yet it's so wearable and it has that highlight that comes from the gold. I'm gonna put it on. Mm -hmm. If you actually have two, you can put the other one facing it and then it gives you the illusion that you have a whole pearl, even though it's, you're basically having again, half a pearl with a gold line in the middle. Yeah. And for me, it really encapsulates what MG Tasaki is about. You still get your pearl jewelry, but you have something that is absolutely different um, and new and... And meticulously made, because that looks probably very difficult to accomplish. Close. So uh -huh. Yeah, there it's in focus. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I think it needs to have my hand at the back, but the angles are just yeah. absolutely... Perfect, yeah. Spectacular, yeah. yes. And I'm going to move on with my personal brand jewelry mm -hmm. um, before I show you. I'll talk to you a bit about it. So I, I've been concentrating on pearls so long and I've always 
notice that there is also mother of pearl, which obviously comes from the oyster that the pearl grows in. And I did a bit of research a few years ago, and I realized that it's used a lot in cosmetic um, industry, and it's also used as inlays for cheaper products. Um, and I was always intrigued by it. Exactly. I was always intrigued by it because it's such a different material than pearl. It comes it sort of flat when you can buy it as tiles. And it can have the same colors as pearls, but it just looks very different and you need to handle it very different. And obviously it never has never reached the status of pearls. You don't really see it on tiaras or royal jewelry. Yeah. Um, it's used a lot in the watch industry. So you see a lot of dials from big houses actually that use and they do very, very intricate designs, which I think means that it can be water jet mm -hmm. uh, cut. Uh, but I was always very intrigued and it's only the last two, three years that I decided to expand what I do for my own brand and start working with Mother of Pearl because I feel about it what I thought about pearl jewelry 10 years ago. It feels very unexplored. Mm -hmm. It's a byproduct. It's considered a byproduct of the pearling industry. And I think it's also time to look at the waste of what we create. So it felt like a very good timing. Um, so one of the first collections that I designed was um, three-dimensional marquetry pieces. You can see this one. I'm going to turn the camera around. You can see this one is done with peacock, mother of pearl, and it replicates a diamond shape, which is instantly recognizable. So I wanted to look into this idea of very expensive gemstones being sold at auction houses for extremely high uh, amounts of money. Mm -hmm. And I'm always interested in craftsmanship and elevating materials which are not considered that expensive to start with, but through craftsmanship actually bring them as high as possible. Mm -hmm. And obviously not everyone can afford these very rare diamonds that go into the millions of dollars so i thought it would be interesting to give the possibility to someone to have their own gemstone or diamond simply made out of something else than an actual diamond so this is a pair of earrings for example made with golden mother of pearl yeah what a color and you really do appreciate mm -hmm. the color of the mother of pearl the mother yeah. Absolutely. And you can see that it looks like a three-dimensional gemstone. So I've, I'm always doing the back and adding as little metal as possible to simply turn it into a piece of jewelry. But what's inside and, that, Eleni? Is it, has, is it set on a frame or is it solid inside? It's, it's solid mother of pearl inside. Okay. So it's completely mother of pearl. It's just that it's, um, let's say, tiled three-dimensionally with those panels because this is how you get the nicest luster yeah. and the inside is um, cut and faceted out of a bigger chunk of mother of pearl because obviously mother of pearl also comes with um, certain restrictions into the size and the thickness that you get specifically yeah. for each color the the pink ones um, the pink muscles have the smallest oysters so you can't get much of it and the white ones which come from Australia for the yeah. South Sea they come much bigger. Therefore, you get bigger pearls. You also get bigger mother of pearl in the white color. Mm -hmm. So, for example, for this bangle, which is, um, I'll show you in a bit, but this is a pretty big size of yellow mother of pearl. And you can really see, I'll show you in a bit, but you can really see the lines and the shine on it. And, and, and you can see what comes out of it. A real pearl. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. I think in some ways you could say that I've been trying to return the pearl to its oyster through the, through the collections. Yes, somehow. Um, I also want to show you this, oh, which this yeah. is flat. So I'm going back to the flatness of Mother. And this is, um, I'll show you through the camera if it presses. Yeah. This really celebrates the different colors and textures while well, inside the mob that you can get. As you can see, it's totally flat. We have those made in Switzerland because they're so hard to make. I mean, you just run your finger through, you don't feel absolutely anything. And there's no coating on top? No, absolutely nothing. It's that just amazing. Perfect. So that's working to micro tolerances. Absolutely. And it needs to be perfect. <laughs> Otherwise, it looks terrible. Yeah. Um, it has a gold bezel. And then at the back, you get three pieces of white mother of pearl because you can't find a big one at that thickness. And this is really um, 
celebrating the colors and the craftsmanship that you can get. And this is um, a collection called Facets, uh, sorry, Gemstones, which was a celebration into all the most popular gemstone cuts that you can find. So there was a cushion, there was a trillion, there was um, a brilliant cut, there was... Uh, what else was there? Oval cut also. And it was so that people instantly recognize that it's a diamond cut and then to be intrigued by the material. Well, you've transformed mother of pearl into something that no one would expect because it is, it is actually throwing off light through the facets as if it were a gemstone, a heart stone. Absolutely. And I think sometimes it's good to step away from taking things as they are, mm -hmm told to us so I'm always intrigued by this idea that when you get engaged or married you have to have a diamond ring and of course in the jewelry industry you know where the slogan comes from and when it was all this, this story created but I think it's good sometimes to just step away from these classics and try to find your own voice and I'm lucky enough to have clients who kind of want to go on that journey with me where you you step back and you think, well, this is really what I want or is this what I'm supposed to want? And I think now more than ever, I feel that women are m more and more opening their ears a bit and, you know, and looking at... Using their eyes. I mean, look how pretty that is. This is my pearl ring. Oh, fantastic. It's, Absolutely. It's from Greece. It's super simple. But yeah, it's got a, a very personal appeal about it because... There's no, no, no other like it, and it's not ostentatious, but I know where it came from. Yeah, and I love it. So, but I, you know, I love pearls, so <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. You're wearing quite a few, yes. I love them. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's just really wonderful to be part of this renaissance uh, of women finding more of their own voice, uh, also finding a renaissance in jewelry design and seeing more designers of my generation really offering new materials or new techniques and just being part of that movement, actually. I'm, I'm very, I feel very um, humbled to be part of this movement. Um, I also wanted to talk to you about the Cube Collection. Yeah. So it is what it's called. Uh, these are 10 millimeter cubes. I'm not very adventurous with my names of the collections, actually. Um, this yeah, is a plop is not a romantic word. <laughs> no, I'm really sorry. This is a perfectly made 10 millimeter cube, um, mm -hmm. and we do those in different colors. This is our more accessible. These are our more accessible pieces. You can see it here, paired uh, with a white freshwater pearl and a pink cube. We do those in all sorts of colors. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the collection that's closest to bringing the pearl back into the oyster because the mop looks like a box out of which the pearl came out. Yeah, so mop, for those of you who... who sorry, know, yes. ...is mother of pearl, but mop, I mean, who wants to... Exactly. <laughs> no, mop, exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't sound very romantic. So what are you uh, <laughs> And it's a collection to be worn every day. And just make that little statement or little highlights in your, in your wardrobe that you, can, that you can really wear effortlessly without really thinking about it too much. Yeah, and, and, and the pearl, which was always just accepted as being round, so could never be sculptural, suddenly becomes a sculpture in your hands, Melanie. Yeah, I think it goes back to the simplest um, forms, a circle mm -hmm. or a ball and a square. And what can you do with it? And I think that's, in a way it potentially gives you a bit of comfort to just have something as simple. It's a bit like the name tag, you know, it can be one of those classics yeah. that you just put on and you don't think about it and it just makes you feel nice about yourself. Um, and I want to finish with the Naker collection because uh -huh. um, that's, again, I mean, they're, they're all my babies. So this is also very close to my heart, but it's almost at the other opposite of the spectrum of the cube. Mm. Um, because I studied sculpture before going into jewelry, I've always had a tendency to create pieces which can sort of stand in their own right, that they look a bit like mini sculptures, but I wanted to push that direction as much as I could. So um, I wanted to show you the Naker collection. And these are pieces which I feel have jewelry elements, mm -hmm. but you're not quite sure what to do with them. You don't even know if you can wear them. And I really like to explore this ambiguity, especially in this collection. 
So you can see this is rose gold with lavender freshwater pearls and pink mop or mother of pearl. These are all unique pieces. And this is an um, open ring, what you would call an open ring. So you can put it on like this. Amazing. That's so clever. The first time I saw that, Mary, I was just amazed. Or you I can put it. it on like this. They have to be comfortable. I always like to create jewelry that's very comfortable to wear. But of course, this. Different Sorry. Did you have like a small, medium and large? Or... For this, we custom make them. So it's basically like going to a haute couture and you have something and then they make it again for you to, the, to your specific size because otherwise it doesn't really work. In the same collection, there is uh, this one. So it was done on purpose to try and match the pearl to the mother of pearl and then to the gold. Mm -hmm. And then this one, let's see. Sorry, it doesn't fit on this one. You can wear it like this. So you can just get a peek of the yellow. Yeah, and I like the, the, way you pearl. the pearl, a functional element of the ring because it's the pearl that's actually keeping the ring fastened to the finger. Absolutely. It has a job, you know. It can't just be decorative. It has to do something. It has to perform. A very useful little pearl. <laughs> yes. Why not, you know? You can't just get a free ride like that. Just no. place on a piece. You have to do something. It certainly is. I, I love those. I think they're so, so clever. And I want to show you a close-up of this, and then I'm going to show it to you on me. This is the necklace. So this, this is a is larger piece. What you were saying earlier about the blister pearls, that is the journey, isn't it? I think this, is the, this represents the journey of... Let me see if I can put it down, actually. This represents the journey of transitioning or incorporating pearls... Uh, with mother of pearl and really I mean you can see the pearl emerging from the mother of pearl or you can see the pearl going into the mother of pearl and disappearing slowly and it's definitely a transition um, design I think where you really can see the movement of the pearl and, and it's just mesmerizing, it. fascinating to see how the pearl melts in or grows out depending on your point of view <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's good. It creates, um, it creates a conversation, I think. And you have the pearl here in the middle, and then you have the asymmetry, which I'm always very fond of in my pieces. And then it just basically goes around your neck effortlessly. So again, you forget that you're wearing it. It's so, and, so simple, but so striking. And this is the last piece that I did. Um, oh, yeah. Let, let, let's before. see when you hold it like that yeah you, you can see how they yeah that looks oh that is so beautiful yeah they've been cut which is of course a bit of a it's considered a sacrilege for golden south seas pearls but I'm, I'm known to also look at them as material and not consider the monetary value that would be incredible. really original i find it fascinating that people think that I'm sometimes i mean not anymore but at the beginning when i was slicing the pearls i used to get a lot of remarks about why are you doing this to the pearls and you're destroying them and you can't do this and then it's um i find it a bit hypocritical because we do so many things to so many other materials mm -hmm. and at the end of the day pearls are also a material so we should explore it as a material otherwise we should keep diamonds in the rough form the way they come out of the earth we shouldn't facet them and so many other uh, uh, you know materials leather wood, everything else. So I'm very glad that you have explored like that, Melanie, because really nobody else has done what you've done with pearls. And it's just always so interesting to see what are you going to do next? So I, I really want to be surprised. <laughs> I hope you will for the 10 year celebration collection. We're working with uh, natural pearls for the first time. Okay. Um, okay. Hippo hippopus ones. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well, but they're a kind of natural pearl. They're white, sort of milky with tiny little flames inside. And I'm also working with diamonds, but a variety of cuts. So old cuts. I didn't want to restrict myself into one cut. So I basically picked the diamonds, depending on the design, but what I felt looked right with the actual design. And of course, mother of pearl. And there is a new technique that I'm using with the mother of pearl. So it's currently all coming together. It's a bit of... Um, stressful time because it needs to look right uh -huh. and I'm not next to the technician because okay. of the virus so I have to do everything with calls and with photographs and whatsapp I mean I'm using every kind of technology there is but at the same time it's nice to have that objective um, view on the piece 
So you see it when it's at different stages and then you can judge it better. So again, it's looking at the, at the good side of, of things. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to seeing them, Melanie. Thank you so much. Really fascinating to understand 10 years of evolution of the Pearl Rebel. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we'll see you again soon, I hope. Absolutely. Hopefully in October and uh, up close also, not just from a, from a screen. Exactly. Well, you keep well, Melanie, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much, Maria. Have a lovely afternoon.